we live our lives here in a, in a comfort zone in many ways. But the devil's out there trying to steal as many of us as he can. He's trying to take our children before they're even born. He's trying to take people and, and deceive them and, and lead them in darkness without ever being able to see the light and acknowledge the truth of who God is. So today, I want to talk a little bit about scoffers, scorners, and mockers. I believe the Lord wants us to see sometimes a scoffer, a scorner, and a mocker may not be very far from home, even in our own lives. The definition of the word scorn is to consider or treat as contemptible or unworthy. To reject or refuse with derision. To despise. So, scoff, the definition says to mock or treat with derision. To show or express derision or scorn. The expression of such an attitude or behavior in speech. Hmm. What is derision? I'm glad you asked Derision, contemptuous or jeering laughter, ridicule, an object of ridicule or a laughing stock. The word mock means to mimic, as in sport or derision, to imitate or counterfeit, an imitation or a counterfeit, to frustrate the hopes of and disappoint. Good definitions there for, for scorn. Scoff and mock. The Urban Dictionary. I don't agree with everything in the Urban Dictionary, but I went ahead and pulled in a definition for you from the Urban Dictionary today. For scoffer says, one, someone who does not believe that God exists. And two, and I liked this one the best, a person who lies constantly and tries to make themselves cool. A person who acts differently when you're hanging out with them alone versus when they're with a the group. That's a scoffer. How many of you ever known people like that? They're all over the place. That's right. Some may dare say, ouch, maybe that touches a little close to home. Maybe I've been there. Done that. Hopefully not wearing the t-shirt anymore. <laughs> Scoffers. Proverbs chapter 9, verse 7 says that he that reproveth a scorner getteth to himself shame. That's how powerful the work of the enemy is in that life. Even when you try to help them his work is so powerful that he'll discredit you, a child of God, a child of light, and you'll feel ashamed. Proverbs chapter 9, verse 8 says, Reprove not a scorner. Now, this is wisdom, right? Proverbs is wisdom. <laughs> I'm going to end up feeling ashamed when I'm done reproving and rebuking and trying to encourage somebody about the right thing. Verse, verse 8 here makes a lot of sense. Reprove not a scorner. <laughs> Amen? Nice instruction there. Reprove not a scorner, lest he hate thee. The Bible says, if you rebuke a wise man, he'll love you. Proverbs chapter 13, verse 1 says, A wise son heareth his father's instruction, but a scorner heareth not rebuke. Proverbs chapter 14 and verse 6 says, A scorner seeketh wisdom and finds it not. But knowledge is easy unto him that understand. A couple more scriptures for you. Proverbs chapter 15 and verse 12 says, A scorner loveth not one who reproved him, neither will he go unto the wise. Proverbs chapter 19 verse 25 says, Smite a scorner. And the simple will beware. And reprove one that hath understanding, and he will understand knowledge. Let the scripture do the outline of what it thinks about scoffers. A few more here for us. Proverbs 21, 11 says, When a scorner is published, 
the simple is made wise. And when the wise is instructed, he receiveth knowledge. Verse 24, same chapter, Proverbs 21 says, Proud and haughty. Proud and haughty scorner is his name, who dealeth in proud wrath. Hmm. And Proverbs 22, verse 10 says, Cast out the scorner, and contention shall go out. Yes, strife and reproach shall cease. You can begin to see the character of one that walks in scorn. Proverbs chapter 24, 4 and verse 9 says, The thought of the foolish is sin, and the scorner is an abomination to men. Now before I leave Proverbs here, for one more scripture in Isaiah. Let's, let's consider the thoughts of the scorner then. The one that is willing to make somebody a laughing stock. And to ridicule somebody. To despise. You can tell that they're proud. And that they're arrogant. And they boast and they know nothing. Willing to lift up their voice. And be heard without thinking about the effects it would even have on somebody else. Not, not let alone the object of their wrath, but the effects around them. The scripture says that we as the saints should study to show ourselves quiet. To let our yea be our yea and our nay be our nay because anything that comes more of that is sin. It's so easy to get caught up into places where we wish our tongue wouldn't go. Because it is filled with an unruly evil. It is set on fire of hell itself, James says. Sometimes we just want to be popular. So we stretch the truth. Oh my gosh, I'm hoping out of a definition here today that it would begin to hit home. I say, Lord, far be it from me. Let me not try to be that person that acts one way with one group of people and another with another group of people or when I'm alone. Word comes to mind, chameleon. But then the definition gave us the word counterfeit. What's a counterfeit? A lookalike. Tries to pass itself off as the original. Strong words. Harsh thoughts regarding the life that is filled with that attitude. But the old man is capable of it all. Even as sons of God, the old man is capable of that lifestyle. Mm -hmm. So before we dismiss it and say, oh, that's not me, you're right, it's not you in Christ. But my Bible tells me that the heart is deceitfully wicked, and who can know it? <clears throat> the battle is for the souls of men. God is waiting for the tapestry of time to unwind so that he can find out who will or who won't be open to the will of the Lord. The souls of men, the cardia, the heart, is where the decision making happens. And it's either under the control of the flesh or it's yielded to the spirit. Notice I didn't say under the control of the spirit. That's not true. God does not dominate our will. That's right. He leaves us open to choice. Yeah. That is why we are to be renewed in the spirit of our mind. The mind is a part of the soul, of the cardia. That is why we are to be under the impression and learning of the scriptures. Be renewed by the spirit. So that we can choose the will of the Lord. Amen. It don't happen automatically. That's right. If we don't choose the will of the Lord, we'll operate according to the old nature, the old man. And it can be just as filled with mocking, scorning, and scoffing as the person that doesn't know Christ. We're so quick. The Lord gives me time. I'll talk about Revelations chapter 2, the church of Ephesus. We're so quick to want to point the finger at those that are sin is so evident without realizing I'm capable of it myself. That's why I must choose to follow the Spirit. I must choose to allow my mind to be renewed by the Spirit, lest I find myself operating 
even looking like an imitator, a counterfeit. Someone that calls on the name of Christ, but you look up my life behind the scenes with certain groups and you go. And I liked how the, the definition brought that out. To frustrate the hopes of and to point, disappoint, you know that we were talking about Matthew chapter 24, because iniquity was shall abound. And the definition of that word iniquity was a lack of standard, a lack of principle. Because people will not hold to an appointed principle, the love of many will grow cold. Why? They're imitating. They're mocking. Gee, that's the scripture. It's saying that we're capable of that. I don't want to be capable of that. I know you don't want to be capable of that. But it's possible. And it happens all the time. And we're not proud of it. But we need to, to hear the word of the Lord. Let him speak to us today so that we can have a mindset. Be renewed in the spirit of our mind. To yield to the inclination, the unction of the Holy One, the Holy Spirit, who leads and guides me in all truth to do His will. For they are the, the sons of God, Romans chapter 8. For many of you that have been following the messages for the last few months, I'm hoping you see the, the, the things that even the Lord is unctioning me to say are from places we've been in the Scripture. I don't have to lay the foundation every time where we've been, but God has truly spoken those things to us. <clears throat> a couple other mentions here Isaiah 29 20 says for the terrible one is brought to naught and the scorner is consumed and all that watch for iniquity are cut off we need to be mindful of our lives that this not be allowed to operate within our lives to have a spirit of imitation about us. To be found walking in the old man, in his old ways, even mocking and scoffing. Scoffing is a lack of faith. For God is. And he rewards them that diligently seek him. So when I sit there and I, and I don't allow myself to confess the things that aren't as though they are, I am not walking in faith. I am not walking by sight. And I'm beginning to be subject to say, well, I don't think so. No, no, that ain't going to happen. That is not faith. In fact, to me, the Lord is showing me that that is scoffing. That is coming against who I am in Christ Jesus. That is not in line with who he's created me to be as a new creation. A person of faith. For the just shall walk by faith. They shall confess the things that are as though they are. They shall not say, oh, it can't be so because my God is able. Amen. My God can reach to the utmost. He can save to the utmost. He can heal. He can work miracles through our lives. We've got to get in tune with this concept. It ain't that God just does miracles. God does miracles through our lives as we follow the unction of the Holy Spirit. Amen. That's right. Amen. The last time you saw a miracle happen when there wasn't a person involved. It's God moving through a person to see something happen. This power have we received in him. Do we let it flow? <clears throat> Ephesians talks about that. I don't got to teach about Ephesians today. According to the power that worketh this. It's his power. We don't boast. We're his vessels. It's time for the church to come alive. I felt that in worship today. Oh my gosh. I, I just started to feel when we start to come alive in the spirit, there's no stopping us. There's no stopping what God can do. But as long as we live, in this vacuum of a lack of purpose, a lack of understanding exactly why I'm here, what the battle is really about, how I should engage every relationship, how I should look at everything. If I'm not renewed according to the spirit of my mind, I will just pass through life and not accomplish anything. Hamster on the wheel. Yeah, hamster on the wheel. Proverbs 20, verse 1 says, Strong wine is a mocker, strong drink is raging, and whosoever is deceived thereby is not wise. I guess I'll take a moment. That was the last scripture I had on, on, on scoffing and mocking. I pulled from the concordance. I figured out which speak as the Lord had me speak. But let me say this. Some of us are new here. You want to understand some things about the way I believe. I want to share the way I believe. I don't drink. Amen. Why? My family was alcoholics. Amen. I was an alcoholic. Me too. But God set me free. Amen. Not because I had to go to AA meetings. 
God set me free when his truth came alive in my life. When his truth came alive, I saw things differently. My Bible tells me that if I'm not careful, alcohol has a tendency to take me out of my right mind. That's why they call it spirits. Yep. Okay. And now the next thing I know, I start to become a mocker. I start to do things I would not normally do under my own impression. Now, I'm not self-righteous. You can have a drink. Go out there and do it. I don't care. Keep it to yourself. <laughs> the only reason I say that is because there might be young believers that don't know how they weigh in on this and who are you to influence them. My Bible, Jesus told me, he said that he that teaches even the least of these something wrong, like a wrong commandment or something. Oh, boy. He, even, he, he, yeah, that's right. He said, you teach somebody that you're the least in the kingdom of heaven. Besides that, there are going to be stripes. There's going to be judgment. Better if you weren't even blowing it on. Yeah. So, so be careful what you allow yourself to confess. Oh, I can do that. I know people that sit there and say, that, that, you know, I, my faith allows that. Well, good for your faith. Keep it to yourself. That's right. Because you don't know who it's stumbling. That's right. In this country, we have a bunch of alcoholics. Yep. Because we got it too easy. We don't have to go out there and work by sweat of our brow. We got, I got a nice office, cushy office job. I'm not saying it's both. I'm just saying because it's so easy, we get time to relax. And what do we do? We turn to things that we ought not to turn to. And it affects our judgment. And we become mockers and scoffers and scorners. And I'll tell you where we're going in the scripture. The men that get caught up in mocking and scoffing and scorning are anti-Christ. They're anti-God, his purpose. In fact, they were the ones that put Jesus on the cross. So it's for me and my house will serve the Lord, and I choose not to indulge myself in alcohol. Amen. Amen. I know the scripture says, I'll take a little wine for your often infirmity. You know, Paul was telling Peter that, or I'm sorry, Timothy. Paul was telling Timothy that, and Timothy was a young man. So I'm not saying, oh, you got to wait till you're aged. No, I'm not, I'm not passing any law on this at all. I'm just telling you my stance on it. I choose not to do it because I was in bondage to it and God set me free. Amen. And those that want to you know, rejoice in that type of thought, praise God, I'm with you. But I'm not here to enforce it. There is no law, there's no touch, not taste, not in the kingdom of God. Amen. It's all by the Spirit who walks by the Spirit. I don't want to be found to be a mocker. I know what it was like. He <laughs> busted them open before I even got home. <laughs> Cracking them in the car. <laughs> Been there, done it. I've been with y'all. I know. Man. God set me free. Amen. So I'm thankful for that. Set me free. I appreciate those that can indulge a little and, and, and keep their mind about them. As long as they're passionate for Christ. As long as their primary focus and mission on life is not about the entertainment of it. You know, how I can just get through. But my focus of it. How I can win the war for souls. I'm fine. So I'm not here to belittle anybody in their choices. But please, let me in, indulge me a little to share my conviction. Amen? Amen? To know a little bit more of where I've come from. You know, it's funny. You know, oh, Lord, I'll just have a little. <laughs> Next thing I know, I'm wasted. You know, six pack, 12 pack later, you know? Uh, you know what I'm saying? Young man, young 20s. Waste. So that was a long time ago. <laughs> I hope I put some. Some, some context to it. Okay. 20, 25 years ago, I was somewhere way back there in another life. <laughs> Amen? Amen? But, you know, I didn't have no control. In 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 3 and 4, Peter said these words. He said, Knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers walking after their own lusts, their own desires, and saying, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. Wow, way to slam God. Things aren't the way they were since creation. I got saved. Amen. You know, he's real to me. His love came and changed my life. I became a new creation, baptized in the Holy Spirit, filled with power and purpose. I ain't the same person I was. I could choose to be a person that's in the flesh. An old man, but I refuse to. Because when I do, I know it grieves the heart of God and it bothers me because I know that's not who I am. Amen. By his grace, I have been saved through faith. And I walk differently now. Like I dragged this old body of death along with me until I hit the grave. Paul said, who shall set me free from the body of death? I thank God in Christ Jesus, I can be free now. Amen? That's right. Amen? That's right. I can be free now and you can be free now. We we worship him in spirit and truth. His eyes go to and fro, looking, seeking for such to worship him in spirit and truth. 
God delights in when we make him the priority. So seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and he will add all things to you. He's going to make sure that he gives you that life abundant. He promised. Amen. He's not withholding any good thing. He loves you. Amen. He loves you. And all he wants is our love in return. If we'll love him and stay consumed with him, right. we will want to do his will. When we do his will, we will see souls saved for his kingdom. That's right. Amen. We will not see the devil win. How about if that was your daughter found out she's 13 years old in an abortion clinic because her boyfriend pressured her in there? <sighs> that stuff's happening all the time. I haven't shut it off, but the statistics are there's a baby aborted every 24 seconds. Yeah. That's a real true story. That video was made over John Elefante's daughter. Almost started with drinking, too. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Jeez. Yeah. So these are real things happening around us. Driving 24 seconds. Okay. That's horrible. So I can't sit there and say this message don't really have any relevance to me today because probably the person next door, their daughter, getting in trouble. Right. How quickly do we want to dismiss some of this stuff sometimes? Right. The battles for souls. <clears throat> the devil's trying to take them out as fast as he can. Let's take him out. <laughs> he doesn't even wait for us to get out of the womb. Most vulnerable state. Amen. I was thinking about that today. That the, the thought had hit me. Where it was in Genesis. And, and the Lord said, Didn't the Lord say that? I want to say this without messing this up. So I'm going to look real quick. But it, I, was, I was pondering this. And the Lord just kind of re brought it back to my. Genesis 3.15 says, And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, between her seed and thy seed. And it shall bruise thy head. And thou shalt bruise his heel. The enmity between his seed and her seed. He's talking to the serpent. And this shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. Is a picture of the church. You and I are the church, the believer. Fighting this fight. That we are not. This is what gave me the thought. I hate spiders. Mm. I hate spiders. I'm not right in there to, when I see a spider, sit there and say, oh, you bad spider. I'm like, give me the, give me the shoe. <laughs> you know? I know you're calling me. That's right. You know, I'm like, I'm like, ah. I, I've got mo the most distance I can possibly have between me and the spider, okay? You know, and so I, I had a, a picture of that. You know, the devil's works is is <coughs> under the foot, That's right. the furthest distance possible from my head. Amen. The works of the kingdom and his mentalities, his ways of mocking and scorning, are to be as far distant from our way of thinking as humanly possible. That was way back in Genesis. He prophesied that. If you're going to overcome the enemy, if you're going to bruise his head, you are going to make sure that his ways are as far from your ways as possible. In other words, I can get my head right down into this thing, you know what I'm saying, where he can deceive me and get me all caught up. Didn't that, didn't that just say that in Proverbs chapter 20? It says, whosoever is deceived thereby is not wise. The wine is a mocker. Strong drink is raging. And if you're deceived by these, you got your mind right down to where it should not be. Amen? Amen. So Peter told us that. He says there was going to be scoffers walking their own desires. And Paul said, and I want to say this in verse, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 20, quote this all the time, for the, the kingdom of God is not in word but in power. I want to say that because this has everything to do with what I'm about to say. Paul said this to Timothy here in 2 Timothy chapter 3, and verses 1 through 5. He says, no, this know also, that in the last days perilous times shall come, for men shall be lovers than their own selves, coaches, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady and high-minded, lovers of pleasures, more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof, from such turn away. 
But I wanted to read you, the kingdom of God is not in word, it's in power. It's not about what you know, what you talk about. It's about the operation of God's purpose, grace in your life. Grace is power. Three definitions, right? Thankfulness, unmerited favor, and power. Operational power of God. And so, here we find out that the church can get caught up in this as well. Because they can have a form of godliness, but deny what's most important, the power. If when we pray things aren't happening, we need to continue to hit our knees because it's not supposed to be so. We talked about that Wednesday. We should not settle for anything less than what God has promised. He said, by his spirit, we would be able to do greater works than these. Out of his belly flowed rivers of living water. The baptism of the Holy Spirit, the promise of the Spirit poured out in our life, empowerment for doing the works that Jesus wants us to do, that God has created us to do. To, to pray and not see results should trouble us. But I think for this generation, for the most part, we talk about this, we've become numb to it. It's just about me going to church. It's about my routine, my pattern of living, whether or not I feel it's good enough and if it's right has nothing to do about the real deal, which is the power of God. So now if I'm not renewed in the spirit of my mind, I can walk through life pretty ignorant for a while. After a while, the truth comes in a place called true life. we got to put a little plug in it. No, you go into a house of God where truth is going to be preached, and he's going to start to un undo some of that thinking. He's going to show you, no, this thing ain't about you just making it. This thing is about my purpose coming alive in you. He starts to confront you with the reality why I created you. He created you for his works. Glory. Amen. Ephesians 2 10. Under good works in Christ Jesus, which God before had preordained that you would walk in them, predestined that you walk in them. God has created you unto reaching people with his love, with his kingdom. That's why you're his ambassador. So it begins to undo some of this self centered thinking we have in our life as a little child. Paul says, When I was a child, I spoke as a child. Right? I, I did the things that little children do. I understood as a child. No harm, no foul. You understand what I'm saying? But when he became a man, what did he do? That's right. So there comes a day when God begins to strengthen you. You think you're going to come into the presence of God in a worship service where people are moving in the power of God and people are being healed, lives are being changed, and you think that you can just stay in your ignorance when God is opening your mind to his purpose for your life? I don't think you can tell God that. Not with any faith anyway. So oh, thanks, God, but... <laughs> to whom much is given, much of you. That's right. That's right. I believe that. I heard that's God. Spider -Man. <laughs> Praise God. So, so we're here to allow God to lead us. Lead us. We are the light of the world. Light has power. Comprehend the uh, darkness comprehends it not. We have power. But we find that in the last days, in these perilous times, that people are going to have a form of godliness, but deny the power. They're not going to allow themselves to say, okay, God. May I begin to see some things differently? I want to walk in your ways more correctly. The Bible tells me that the path of the righteous gets brighter and brighter. If I don't walk with God, it isn't going to get brighter and brighter. I may still be saved, amen. But I want to see my path get brighter and brighter. Who's at the end of that, that path? Jesus. Amen. He's at the end of that path. That's why it gets brighter and brighter, because he is the light. Amen. And the light was the life of men. I don't know about you, but that's the path I want to be on. Because he's the way. The he's the truth. The set before us. Amen. Nobody comes to the Father except through him. Now, what do, what do mockers do? Matthew chapter 2. I'm doing good at time. Matthew chapter 2 here. Great account. Christmas story. You know, we always get into this around Christmas time. But you know, I was in this the other day. It was last week, I think it was. I was looking at this, and I was really just in awe at how man thinks I, I, I was it, it, it's what really I think began to percolate this in my spirit for the last two weeks about scoffers King Herod was also a scoffer King Herod was over the, 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 the Jewish nation there you know he's, he's reigning and he's worried about the king of the Jews being born 
here I'm saying it doesn't matter that it's a godly nation. It doesn't matter that it's prophesied. It's supposed to happen. In fact, when you begin to read this, you get a new appreciation for the whole thing. You get a whole new appreciation when you look at some of the wording. It says, when Herod the king had heard these things, he was troubled. Because in, in verse 2, uh, verse 1 and 2 here, we find that wise men came to Jerusalem seeking for the king of the Jews. And so in verse 4, you find out that he's so insecure that he's got to call together the chief priests and scribes and he's got to inquire where Christ was to be born. Didn't matter. This is of God. Herod is a scoffer. Oh, but what, how does he play it off as an imitator? He's got to look good or people wouldn't allow him to be in power. I believe, he, you know, what they call it, a coup? <laughs> you get enough people to take, you know, you kill them. They take them out, right? Uncoup. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and so when the, when the chiefs and the, the scribes had, had told them that it was going to be in Bethlehem, then Herod called privately, verse 7, the wise men, and started to inquire when the star appeared, and sent him off and said, Go search, verse 8, diligently for the young child. And when you found him, bring me word again that I may come and worship him. So here we are, Herod being the imitator. Well, yeah, I believe in God. Praise God for the prophecy. He's going to be born in Bethlehem according to this season. That star, that's great. When you find him, let me know. So I can come worship him. I don't think Herod was of God at all. He was just operating out of his insecurity as a scoffer, totally against the things of God. So much so that when you read down here a little bit further, that after they had come to, to find the Lord and, and they left him with gifts, and this is, what, this is a little nugget for Christmas, just give you a little Christmas nugget, okay? Guess what? This is cool. In verse 11, they came into the house and, Mary, and they found Mary with the child. And they fell down and they worshipped him and they had opened their treasures and they gave him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. But verse 12 says, And being warned in a dream that they should not return to Herod, they went to another country. And so when they departed, then the angel of the Lord came to Joseph, and he said, Arise and take the young child and his mother into Egypt. Guess what? They didn't go poor. Because there were some treasures left. <laughs> Frankincense, murder, and gold. <laughs> they didn't go poor. God provides. They had a journey to take to get out of Herod's way, and God provided. It was like, wow, that was just like fresh old nugget to me. It was like, yeah, Lord, man, they left in style. They had, they had some goods. Like limo. Yeah, right, because you know, we're thinking, you know, oh, here they are, they're in the manger, there's no place to stay, they don't got any money, but God seen to it where there was a need, he provided. And they left, and they had some good stuff. Amen. They had some good stuff. They could trade with it. Back in the day, you know how that's how, yeah. that's how it worked. So God took care of them. That was just a quick nugget. God will take care of you. Yeah. That's a Christmas nugget. That's good. But you see what's going on here. They, they went, verse 12, they went out a different way to their own country. They did not return to Herod, the wise men. And so when verse 14 comes around, Joseph leaves, and they go into the next country. And verse 15 says, uh, well, they waited until the death of Herod when they come back. But verse 16, Herod, when he saw that he was mocked of the wise men, that's kind of cool, God mocked him back. <laughs> he was exceedingly wroth, and then he set forth and he slew all the children that were in Bethlehem and all the coasts thereof from, the years, from two years old and under, according to the time which he had diligently inquired of the wise men. So that's the last kind of thing I want to talk about. But look at what his wrath did. His scorning of God's purpose. He didn't care how many lives he took out. He's like, you better kill them all. Don't let me go into the region and find one baby under you know, two years old and under. It's like, how can you be that heartless? How can you be that cold? But when you are a mocker, when you're a scoffer, and you're not chucking it at the door, your words can kill, they can cut. The Bible tells me that the power of life and death is in the tongue. A lot of times we're quick to say something. We've got a little quip and we say it and cut somebody. Took a little bit of their life away from them. Because now they're going to need healed again. Mm -hmm. They're going to need to forget about it so they can move on. Man, I'm telling you, these are things that we as the sons of God need to consider. Let our yea be our yea and our nay be our nay. I'm not saying we can't be fun folks, but boy, how much we need to let the Holy Spirit have control of the tongue. Mm -hmm. In Matthew chapter 27, verses 35 to 44, the account of the crucifixion here, according to Matthew's gospel, 
And they crucified him, and they parted his garments, casting lots, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the prophet. They parted my garments among them, and my vesture did they cast lots. And sitting down, they watched him there. Who watched him there? Those that were casting lots over his vesture for his garment, when they tore his garment. Into. The soldiers, mockers, they were sitting why, why do I know they were mockers? Because they put this accus accusation over his head. This is Jesus, the king of the Jews. Verse 38 says, There were two thieves crucified with him, one on the right, one on the left. And, as, and they that passed by reviled them, wagging their heads and saying, Thou destroyest the temple and build it in three days. Save thyself. If thou be the Son of God, come down from the cross. Likewise, also the chief priests mocking him were the scribes in the with the scribes and the elders said, He saved others, himself he cannot save. If he be the king of Israel, let him now come down off the cross, and we will believe in him. He trusted in God, let him deliver him now, and if he will have him, for he said, I am the Son of God. The thieves also, which were crucified with him, cast the same in his teeth. We also know there's an account of one of those thieves turning to the Lord. We know that every one of the disciples forsook him. Every one of them. There wasn't a man of God sitting there at the cross to come to his defense. Everyone had forsook him. And that means how, how, how this is so powerful to us. There isn't any of us that are beyond it. There isn't any of us that can escape the potential of saying the wrong things and allowing our heart to be in the wrong place. Because none were found to be with him at the cross. All those that he had poured his life into for three years to minister, to serve, to raise up, and encourage, to take his message, they all forsook him. There was none at the cross save mockers, scoffers. And I think that paints a really powerful illustration of exactly what God thinks of mockers. They were the people that put me on the cross. So if we, we find how heinous that is to us, how, how sickening that ought to be, that that should be something that is not a light word to us, but my gosh, when I get caught up in this, I'm just as guilty as those that were standing in front of that yelling at him, you be the son of God crawling off that cross. Wow. Sometimes we make way too much allowance for our flesh. Amen? We make way too much allowance. We need to see it the way God sees it. You have something first? Yeah, I was going to say, uh, it didn't go well for the youths that were mocking Elijah. Go up, ye bald head. Remember what God yeah. do? Set a bear out and maul them all. <laughs> there is a double-edged sword to this message. Take heed to yourself. Take heed to yourself. You'll save others when you preach. The other is, I can become guilty of being self-righteous. I can find myself in the place of the Church of Ephesus, like I said, I might mention in Revelation chapter 2 there, where they had they'd grown cold in their first love. They were known for their works, that they hated the deeds of the Nicolaitans, that they, they were about the right things and hated the, the appearance of sin. The double-edged sword is if we get too carried away, not recognizing when we need to have mercy upon those that are totally lost, we can become self-righteous. We can negate the grace to be able to reach them, and they'll be repelled by us versus drawn. So we have to be the ambassador that has a delicate balance. I hate the sin, how it can have root in my life through the old man, but I will not judge or condemn the man that I see operating in it because God wants to save them. Fine mind. And we need, yes, absolutely, that's what I'm saying. It's a double-edged sword. It's a very, very sensitive topic. We can all become very dogmatic very, very quickly. Been in churches, having the teacher. I know, I know how it works. God ain't calling us to be dogmatic. He's calling us to be a people of grace and mercy that we might reach people. But he wants us to be the vessels of honor. The vessels of honor, not vessels of dishonor. And that comes by taking heed to ourselves. And so today we're here to to celebrate and partake of communion.
So if you'll turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Paul says this in verse 17. He says, Now this I say and I declare unto you, I, that I praise you not, that ye come together not for the better, but for the worse. For first of all, when you come together in a church, I hear that there be divisions among you. And I partly believe it. For there must, must also be some heresies among you, that they who are, which are approved may be made manifest among you. That when you come together, therefore, into one place, this is not to eat the Lord's Supper. For in eating, everyone taketh before the other his own supper. And one is hungry, and another is drunken. What? Have you not houses to eat and drink in? Or despise ye the church of God? Who's the church? Yeah, we are. Despise ye the church of God, and shame them that have not. What shall I say to you? Shall I praise you in this? I praise you not. For I have received the Lord that which I have also delivered unto you. That the Lord Jesus on the same night that he was betrayed took bread. The same night that they betrayed him. The same night that sinners and scorners and mockers we're out to take his life from him. That he gave of himself. He did not let that move him. He did not let their determination against God to stop his purpose of loving them. To give them a peace and assurance forever and ever that if you will consider yourself, if you will partake of this supper worthily, you shall not die. For he said... That he took the bread, and when he had given thanks for the bread, he broke it. And Father, we thank you for this bread this morning that's broken for us. You are the bread of life, Lord Jesus. Your words, they are words of life. You have shared them to us by your spirit. You said your words are spirit and they are life. <laughs> Lord, you said, he that hath ears, let him hear what the spirit says to the church. And so, Lord, this morning, we thank you for this bread that has been broken for us that has been given to us that we might hear and understand that we might truly be the sons of God that don't get tripped up by the natural lusts and affections of the old man which is part of the perilous days that we live in Lord but Father that we're sober just men by your spirit able to discern your will so, Lord, we thank you, Lord, for this bread that's been broken, for our ears that have been able to receive your word this morning. And, Lord, you, you said, take, eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. And so, today, Lord, we want to ask you to bless these, these elements that represent your body and your blood. And say, Lord, we do know, Lord, that you kept yourself under subjection even to the end, Lord, when they were mocking, when they were scorning, when they were crucifying you, Lord. You didn't, you, didn't, you didn't rail back. You didn't render railing for railing. You did not curse back. You did not do anything unbecoming of what the Father had called you to do. But, Lord, you yielded. You had the power to, to call upon 12 legions at any moment and have them come and consume them that were mocking and scorning. But, Lord, that was not the purpose. Lord, you were there to show us and give us an example of how maybe even when we have to pass through the fire, when we go through the storm, that we can still stand on the other side. It will not consume us. So, Lord, we thank you, Father, for your brokenness, Lord, that it has given us an example, that we know that we can follow, that ever, after having done all, that we indeed shall stand. So, Lord, we'll partake of this. Let's partake of it. And after the same manner, he also took the cup. And when he had supped, he said, this is the, this is the cup of the, the New Testament in my blood. This is the commitment that I've made to you. This is sealed by my own blood that I will pour out on the heavenly mercy seat that my father will never reject me ever again. For 
For he knew that he was to hang on that cross and take upon him the sin of the world. And that he would feel the separation from his father. Which would be an eternal anguish. Even the second death it's described, to be removed from the presence of the father. And he would feel that and suffer that for us when he had done nothing wrong, nothing deserving. But he would take that blood then in triumph and victory. And he would walk boldly into the Holy of Holies in heaven, which we were given an example. Things were written in type and shadow that we might see realities of the eternal down here in the natural. And he would walk boldly into the Holy of Holies and pour out the blood on the mercy seat. <clears throat> that the enemy and evil could never triumph again over God's purpose and plan for humanity. And so he says, take and drink. This cup represents my blood. It represents the new covenant that I have made between my Father and I to seal your redemption in heaven. Take and drink. He says, "For do this often, for as often as you drink it, you do it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do show, show the Lord's death till he come. Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily, he shall be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. So verse 28, let a man examine himself. Let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. Let us do it today knowing it's not about yielding to the lower, the, end, the old man, the impulses, the old nature. It's not about being found a mocker, a scorner, a scoffer. It's about being the man and woman of God that God's called you to be. A child that begins to put away the childish things. Becoming a man. Becoming someone that will follow the lead of the Spirit. Being a son of God here in the earth to do his Father's will. Renewed in the spirit of our mind knowing that the battle is for souls. And as for me and my house, we shall serve the Lord. Amen. 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 For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily, verse 29 says, he, he drinks damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. And for this cause, many are weak and sick among you, and many sleep, or dead. For if we, we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. When you are judged, we are chastened of the Lord, that we should not be condemned with the world. Wherefore, my brethren, when you come to, together to eat, tarry for one another. Today I want to close with a worship song. Have the worship team come up. And as we as we get ready to celebrate this time, remember what the Lord has done for us. We've judged ourselves, we've determined within ourselves. And in this heart, there is no good thing. So we come to offer our lives as living sacrifices. And so we'll take offering during the course of the song. And I pray that your reflection would be, as you've offered your time and your tithe and your talents, that it would be found worthy of what the Lord has done for you. Give to him cheerfully. Not just your money, but your life. Give him the thoughts of your heart. Let the meditation of your heart be upon him continually. For he loves you, and he will bless you. If you seek him first in his kingdom, he'll add all things to your life. You don't have to operate and live according to the stress of this world. The steps of a righteous man, they are indeed ordered of God. And God does take care of his little children. God takes care of not only his family, but he empowers us to be able to do his business. To do his bidding. We are given the great commission of taking the kingdom of God to this world. I don't know when's the last time you saw a little child take his responsibility to the world. It's usually all about having his needs met. Amen? Mm -hmm. But God has called us and commissioned us to do his bidding. So that goes to show you the state that we are not to remain as little children. But we are to mature, to grow into the stature of the fullness of Christ. Doing the Father's bidding, 
praying his kingdom come and his will be done here on earth as it is in heaven. So today, be willing to put away the childish things and say, yes, Lord. So for me and my house, we will serve you. Let mocking be far from us. Let, let, let being of little faith and denying what you can do be far from me. Let me confess those things you can do. Let me try that for a change. God will change things in your life. He'll add unto you all things because he'll honor you for seeking him first. Amen? Amen. Praise God.